Hello, today we're going to talk about life history traits, which are products of natural selection. Traits that affect an organism's schedule of reproduction and survival. Okay, let's get serious for a second. Uh, when we talk about Darwinian fitness this year, uh, when we talk about fitness in general in this class, we're not going to be talking about uh, physical fitness like this uh, guy right here. We're going to be talking about Darwinian fitness, which is measured by the number of offspring that an organism has uh, that actually live to reproduce themselves. So uh, that's going to be the definition of fitness that we use uh, this year. And so one thing to consider when we're talking about um, strategies of reproduction and survival and, and reproductive success um, is uh, this conflict that exists between the two. So you might think that from an evolutionary standpoint, the ideal situation would be reproduce as much as possible, bam, 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 um, reproduce tons of offspring and many, many times. Uh, but, you know, think about what are some constraints, uh, what are some uh, limitations to that um, that we've already talked about when we talked about uh, logistic growth curves. So we know that resources are finite, um, and we know that there are uh, other alternative strategies that probably promote Darwinian fitness in a better way. So maybe if you have fewer offspring but provide more maternal care, that those individuals themselves will be more fit uh, to reproduce. And so today we're going to talk about um, uh, those types of life history traits that contribute to these different strategies. Um, this is the view from my in-laws place in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia and uh, one time last year or the year before we went up to uh, visit uh, and they were banding kestrels uh, in the side side of the house so uh, we participated in that and uh, this is a picture that I took looking down into a kestrel uh, nest nesting box and you can see one two three four five kestrels in this brood um, and uh, the fifth one is down there in the bottom left you can't really see it but I can tell you mama was not really happy with the uh, human visitors um, she was uh, really not happy at all um, but a study of European kestrels um, showed uh, you know similar normal brood size um, but also looked at what happens if you reduce the amount of offspring um, and what happens if you increase the amount of offspring uh, what effect does that have on the survivability of the parents? And what you see in this study was a pretty clear uh, indication that reproduction is expensive. It's costly to the parents uh, um, in their time and, and, and energy uh, that is involved in uh, maintaining uh, and, and the care and, and kestrels is, is provided by both male and female. But what you see in this graph is really a negative correlation between um, the brood size and the survivability of the parents. Okay, so particularly in this enlarged seven to eight, it's really just exhausting for these parents. So what are some reproductive strategies that organisms use and, and how can we tie these strategies into our understanding of the um, growth curves that we've talked about um, so far in, in population ecology. So simul paris or simul parity um, is seen in organisms like the coho salmon and agave. This is a big bang type of reproduction um, that really is more common in less favorable environments. So it's, it's to an organism's advantage if they live in a really unfavorable, dry maybe environment like the agave where you don't get a lot of rain to just reproduce once in response to signals that uh, maybe there was a rain event and that would promote uh, surviving offspring in one huge reproductive event. And that's what happens. And coho salmon uh, just reproduce once and they die. Um, and so that's one strategy. The other strategy is iteroparity, which uh, is seen in humans um, and also in 
sea turtles and, and animals that just repeat um, their reproductive events. Um, these are typically longer lived organisms that care, provide parental care uh, for their young. And so, um, again, the survivability, of the survival rate of the offspring and the parent's likelihood to reproduce again uh, kind of determines uh, which one of these strategies evolves. And so in humans, obviously, um, you know, we provide more parental care. And so the parents are more likely to survive um, in, this, in this situation. Um, along with these life history traits that we're looking at and reading about in this chapter, uh, there's two types of selection that I want to go over, um, which are density independent selection uh, or R selection and traits associated with that. So I want to go through that and, and provide some examples. And then density dependent selection, which is K selection. So density independent selection, um, these are traits uh, that uh, the R selected traits, short lifespan, small body size, uh, reproduce quickly, tons of offspring, tons of babies, things like cockroaches, weeds, bacteria, things that just um, also have a high mortality um, of those offspring. And this is optimized for just maximum reproductive success in uncrowded environments. Um, whereas density of dependent selection is different. Uh, think about that carrying capacity line and as organisms get in a crowded environment um, the selection for traits is different. Okay, So if you're selecting for traits that are sensitive to that population density and are more favorable at a higher density, then uh, you're going to see things like more longer lifespan, large body size, slow reproduction, fewer young, and more parental care. So um, humans, elephants, mature trees uh, adopt this type of uh, strategy. So let's go through some examples and just see if you can identify um, are we talking about a density dependent uh, selection or are we talking about density independent selection are selected traits. Okay, so a good example of K selected organism or density dependent are R selected, right? Density dependent, density independent, ribbit. Density dependent, or K. Okay. Density dependent. Sea turtles. So some species actually have, uh, this is not a black and white thing, so some have exceptions and are maybe combinations of the two. Uh, sea turtles are large and they live a long time, but uh, they produce a lot of, you know, their survivability of their offspring um, rates of survival are anywhere between one in a thousand, one in 10,000 actually make it to sexual maturity, which takes 30 years to reach. So um, that this is an example that exhibits both. Okay, density dependent. Hmm, oak trees. Well, another exception uh, exhibits both live a long time, but they do reproduce um, lots of acorns at once, which um, don't all, all survive, obviously. Okay, independent, density independent. Density dependent, density dependent. Our selected density independent and density dependent. Okay, so how do you read survivorship curves and what are they, what are they uh, telling us? Um, these survivorship curves uh, really reflect this R and K selection that we just talked about. Type one uh, populations, type one species like humans, um, exhibit this K selection. Um, what this graph shows is, you know, 
proportion of individuals that are surviving, and then you can see over time um, that that number drops off towards uh, the uh, later in, in lifespan. So long-lived individuals. Uh, the more or less constant mortality um, in the type 2 curve is seen by this linear trend that um, just kind of shows a constant mortality. Birds and and uh, small mammals, things like that, exhibit that type. But then R selected is seen uh, on this bottom curve where you got a high degree of mortality early in life and just few survivors uh, towards later in life. Um, so this just plots the number of individuals in uh, a group of individuals of the same age over time that are still alive. Okay, so. Uh, the last little section of this chapter talks about demographics, and so um, some questions to think about, uh, you know, in terms of studying for this and and uh, things to expect. You know, you want to be able to interpret population pyramids and, and patterns and um, human populations. Those are always uh, popular questions that you'll see on, on exams. Um, so think about, you know, why why human populations um, grow slowly. Uh, despite high birth rates and, and what are some of those factors uh, that lower the death rates. Um, and as, as countries go from a developing country to a developed country, we call that a demographic transition uh, because uh, w the more developed a country becomes, those birth rates and those death rates get lower because of better um, technology, better, better medical care. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, so what do those look like in terms of uh, population pyramids? Well, you know, you've seen this before in, in ninth grade biology, and so you want to be able to interpret um, what these demographics uh, show in terms of population growth rate. So what you see in Ken Kenya, this classic pyramid shape, is showing just a really expanding, developing country with rapid population growth. A large proportion of those um, individuals entering sexual maturity um, that will provide even you know just a fast rapid growth uh, the US has more more or less stable or slow growth and you see this by this column uh, more or less even distribution of individuals throughout age cohorts and then when you have a shrinking population um, you'll start to see uh, this pattern that you see f with Italy, where the in individuals entering reproductive age and the birth rates are, are so low that the population is actually starting to shrink. Um, and so if we think about the global population, the global human population, um, you know, think about what might be the carrying capacity uh, and what are some factors involved in, in the carrying capacity for humans on our planet. So really briefly, uh, just want to point out this uh, ecological footprint because it's just um, interesting data and hopefully this data, uh, and as you guys study uh, populations, you kind of understand how this might inform policy decisions for countries in terms of the ecological footprint. So I just wanted to point out the difference between the black dots and the blue dots. Uh, the black dots are countries in which the ecological footprint exceeds the available ecological capacity. The blue dots are the countries in which uh, their ecological capacity exceeds how much uh, of a footprint they have. So um, it's interesting to, to think about that and, um, and as you guys consider what an ecological footprint is and, and look at this data. Um, uh, you know, think about uh, what I want you to think about are, are ways that countries can make uh, decisions that might affect um, an ecological footprint uh, change towards sustainability. So I hope that uh, I hope this data is helpful in, in getting you to think about those kinds of things.